Father, we ask for your help to understand your word. Let us not shrink from the challenges in it, but be made humble, our hearts softened, that we might grasp with joy what you have to say to us and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. So on recent Sunday evenings in our journey through John, we've been focusing on the raising of Lazarus and its aftermath. That included the plots against Jesus, his withdrawal and return around the time of Passover, his anointing at Bethany by Mary, and the Lord's rebuke of Ju Judas for his tone-deaf criticism of Mary, which may have been the tipping point in his disillusionment, his resolve to betray Jesus. So tonight we're looking at the triumphal entry of our Lord into Jerusalem, which is covered by all the Gospel writers, but with um, the unique slant that John places on it, wherein he ties it in with Lazarus. Then second, the triumphal entry, verse 12 to 15. And thirdly, just various reactions to Jesus, verse 16 to 19. So let's first look at what led up to the plot against Lazarus in verse 9 to 11 of John 12. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So the people who came to see Jesus here in verse 9 were not the leaders, they were ordinary Jews, excited by the reports of the raising of Lazarus. Bethany was not far from Jerusalem at all, and news soon spread to many about this mighty sign of Jesus. And so instead of focusing on the Passover, crowds of Jewish pilgrims now flocked to see Jesus, whom they'd found out was still there. They converged on Bethany, which suddenly became a rival place of pilgrimage to the capital itself. And they also wanted to meet Lazarus in person, this living miracle, a man who had experienced death and yet come back from it. Now the chief priests, hearing of this, took counsel together, verse 10, they couldn't tolerate this turn of events, and having already plotted to kill Jesus, 1153, they now resolved that Lazarus too must be eliminated. Now they may have believed that it was never a genuine resurrection, that it was all staged and fake. And so they would have thought that by killing Lazarus, we'll, we'll put that myth to bed, right? But whether they believed it was true or not, the real issue was that Lazarus was a major reason why even more Jews were deserting their leaders, verse 11, and going over to the side of Jesus and putting their faith in him. Their numbers were increasing and the chief priests could see that this was a threat to their authority and order. It was doing untold mischief to their reputation, the Jews switching their allegiance. And as for the Sadducees especially, this, this was a clear denial and affront to their doctrine that there was no resurrection, past, present or future. People who don't fit the narrative, people who in Christ are no longer what some of you were. 1 Corinthians 6 we read on Wednesday. They will very likely come under attack from those who accuse of hate, but are really full of it themselves. How long before we see martyrs in this land again, just for daring to say that Christ has given them new life and brought them out of sin? Don't call that sin, but I've been saved from it. Lazarus was really raised from the dead, and for that they wanted him dead. Second, the triumphal entry, verse 12, to 15. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. 
Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So on the morrow, verse 12, that's a time marker. It places these events as happening the day after the anointing at Bethany and the activity of the Jews and the chief priests surrounding all that. Time seems to slow were converging on Jerusalem for the feast, possibly in the millions. Policing them was already a nightmare without the added excitement when they heard that Jesus too was on his way to Jerusalem. So this crowd was not the same people that had come to Bethany. Many would have traveled from as far away as Galilee and elsewhere to Jerusalem. Josephus estimated their annual numbers at about over 2.7 million. Uh, and the, the Galileans would have been familiar with Jesus' ministry and his challenge to the priests. They would have considered him one of them, as well as a likely candidate for Messiah. And so nationalism, regionalism, and religious fervor all combined. This was the moment they'd been waiting for, and they, they took to it with enthusiasm. What did they do? They took the, the branches of date palms that they picked on the way for the Passover, verse 13, and used them instead to go out to meet Jesus as a VIP with these makeshift banners, loud acclamations. Apparently the date palm doesn't, didn't grow near Jerusalem, but this may be why. The spontaneous stripping of masses of branches on that kind of scale would no doubt put off any would-be cultivators. In fact, the Judean date actually went extinct soon after that. It, it was revived only recently when seeds were found in the ruins of Masada and taken to Kew Gardens and successfully grown. If you're not sure about that, Google it like I did. And so this crowd went out to meet Jesus, waving the branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this uh, Passover festival took on more of the appearance of a Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Leviticus 23, 40, on the first day, take the best fruits, palm branches, the branches of leafy trees and poplars, and celebrate in the presence of the Lord your God for seven days. And palm branches also signify victory. And they were often used to express joy and general festivity. In Revelation 7, 9, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and peoples and languages, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Images of palms appeared on Jewish coins in that period, sometimes having the inscription, the redemption of Zion. And it may be that the crowds saw Jesus as that redeemer, not with full understanding, but as a welcome conqueror of their corrupt rulers, which would only make those leaders even more angry. No doubt. So Christ was entering in, in triumph, symbolizing his true nature and identity. As he approached those city gates, the people from inside would have swarmed out and mingled with those who were on their way in, completely blocking the main roads, a mass of people, and, and reciting Psalm 118, which we read earlier. That was part of the traditional liturgy, not only for Passover, but for tabernacles, and the, the Feast of Dedication was similar too. Uh, Psalm 108, 25 to 26 are the lines. Uh, Save now, I pray, O Lord, that's what Hosanna means. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And some have suggested from those similarities that the, the entry of Jesus here served as a rededication of the temple, that the house of the Lord, of him coming to his temple in a new way. I mean, the behavior of the crowds themselves was just entirely spontaneous. It was done without much thought, even if God used it to fulfill that prophecy. The words of the psalm, Hosanna, means save now, we pray. It's a prayer. They were putting their trust in Jesus, maybe to solve their political problems, but maybe something more. From their point of view, it might just have been used as a, as a populist interjection, like people do in crowds. But John maybe looks beyond this 
to the reality of Christ's power and purpose to save. He came indeed in the name of the Lord as the blessed Jesus, the saviour of the world. And they sang his praises with, with that messianic slogan. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is doing the work and bearing the authority of God himself. Possibly they, they spoke more than they knew. They didn't realise just how much he was in the name of the Lord. The expression as it's used in the Bible has, the, has a deeper significance of carrying the full rank and authority of the deity. Someone described in this way is implied to share the character, the reputation of the Lord speaking and acting representatively of him. So this describes the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's also indicative of the earlier prophets and future believers. Um, Mark 16, 17 to 18, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will all be made well in his name. I mean, those things are not to be tried at home to test the Lord. But if it comes to a critical situation, yes, he may intervene in these ways. And there are testimonies to that. We too, in him, have kingdom authority to exercise in his name. So the Jews were expecting one to come in God's name, and they felt that Christ was that one. And not only that, blessed is the king of Israel. Now that wasn't even in the psalm. They've added it on. But like that other add-on, the filioque clause is not wrong. But it was even more pro provocative. Blessed is the king of Israel. That's unique to John's account of the entry. It appears elsewhere in the Gospels, though, and, and the idea of kingship serves later to give the charge on which Jesus is put to death. In John 19, 12. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever make himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So the kingship was the charge on which he was put to death. Jesus had earlier refused to be made king in John 6 15 therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. But now he seemed to accept all this ovation as he quietly and carefully made his way in trying to not get completely swamped in this crowd, but to actually get to his destination. Uh, but it was true of him. John 1, 49, Rabbi cried, Nathaniel, you are the son of God. You are Israel's king. He is the king. And yet his riding into Jerusalem on a donkey symbolized the Prince of Peace, a very different concept of Messiah from the popular one. The crowds seemed to fully expect a political nationalistic revival through this man that would not be but nevertheless he was their king and we're told that jesus had found a, a young donkey or ass verse 14 or possibly a donkey and its foal john doesn't go into how he came by it but mark tells us it was by the agency of his disciples they've been directed where to find it they put their cloaks on it and sat him upon it uh, we can find it in mark 11 1 to 8, we could read that as part of the story. Mark 11, 1 to 8. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell them, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. The ass was considered 
an animal of peace, as opposed to the war horse. It was not what some had been expecting, who wanted a political uprising. Judas may have been among those. But all John is interested in here is the detailed, acted fulfillment of prophecy, of scripture. Jesus rode in on that humble donkey, consciously fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9. Exalt greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. A just saviour is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We see the same verse cited in verse 15 of our text, but instead of rejoice greatly, John renders it, do not be afraid. We do, however, find the expression in many similar prophecies, such as Isaiah 40, verse 9, Go up on a high mountain, O herald Zion. Shout out loudly, O herald Jerusalem. Shout, don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. And we know too that Jesus often himself used that expression, fear not. And then daughters of Zion, that's a collective expression. Hebrew tends to use feminine nouns in collective phrases, but that does not make the people referred to exclusively female. Strictly speaking, Zion referred to the citadel in Jerusalem or the mount that it was built on, but it later came to mean the whole city. And daughters, as a collective, means the inhabitants of Jerusalem generally. That's what he's talking about. So a king coming on a donkey's colt should remind us that Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace. Asses weren't ridden by warriors, but by priests, merchants, prophets, and so on. A ruler might choose to use one if he came in peace. And there's also the element of lowliness, a great lack of any ostentation or wealth. You see, a typical conqueror would normally choose his prized battle steed, today maybe a fleet of tanks. Notably, when uh, General Allenby captured Jerusalem in World War I, he, he marched in on foot at the head of his troops out of respect for the locals with whom he had no quarrel. And he even appointed Muslim Empire troops to guard the mosques and Jewish ones to guard the synagogues, etc. A clever man was Allenby, and a benign force uh, on the whole was the British Empire. Jesus was coming in peace, as Zechariah put it, righteous and having salvation. That is the kind of kingship Jesus identified with by fulfilling this prophecy. But the reactions to him varied, verse 16 to 19. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him had continued to spread the word that he had called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So the disciples of Jesus observed these things and even participated in them, but at the time they didn't fully understand the royal significance of these signs and illusions. Verse 16, that Jesus was coming indeed as the messianic king, yet humbly on a donkey to reign by dying. So the triumphal entry was not the glorification of Jesus. That was the cross, the resurrection, the ascension. Later then, when Jesus was glorified, as he would soon promise, he would send his spirit to explain to them the reality of his ministry. Uh, John 16, 13 to 14. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears. And he will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me by taking from what is mine and disclosing it to you. But not yet. The disciples are often portrayed as slow of heart and understanding. They might have missed the whole significance of the donkey's cult, even though they knew God's word, that the passage described a king coming. But when the spirit came, 
they realized that all these things had been written about him and also that they themselves, the disciples, had done them to him. And the crowds too seemed to understand something of this, but their reverence of him would prove very superficial. Only later, partly when Jesus taught his people post-resurrection and more fully at Pentecost, would they recall these events in their, their full significance. See, this verse 16 is a bit unusual for John grammatically. He really seems to labor the point. Anyone can read these things in the Bible, but he's saying that not to everyone will God reveal it in fullness. That is only to happen as he sends the Holy Spirit. The disciples were caught up in the fervor of the crowds who recognized Jesus as their messianic king, but they misunderstood the true nature of that kingship. And the disciples too, they were still thinking about it politically, even after the resurrection, Acts 1, 6. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But never again was such a question asked after Pentecost. We now hear about a different group, verse 17. Those who had possibly witnessed the raising of Lazarus from the dead just by Jesus calling him from the tomb. That was the amazing bit about it. This had been such a profound and stupendous miracle that they were still testifying to it as they have been since chapter 11. This miracle was beyond anything people had heard of. After four days this was done and the crowd testified to the power of Jesus in performing such mighty signs. And this just added a new dimension of excitability to the masses. Those who had met Jesus on the road or heard that he was approaching the city, it was just what the leaders didn't want. It caused a growing number, including locals, to come out of the city wanting to meet Jesus, verse 18, whom they, they'd heard had given this great miraculous sign, raising someone from the dead. So they suspended their pre-Passover ablutions, 1155, because someone greater than the Passover was here. This must be God's anointed Messiah. Out they came, converging with those pilgrims, trying to get into the city, and the result would have been mayhem, a growing knot of people, mobbing Jesus on his donkey, that was beyond the control of the governing authorities. There was no way in the world they were going to arrest him that day. And so at last we get the reaction to all this of the Pharisees, verse 19. It's understandably pessimistic. Uh, among themselves, they acknowledged their impotence to control the scene, seeing all this fever pitch fervor surrounding Jesus and decided not them. They seem to be left without a solution to this Jesus phenomenon. Uh, and they were clearly frustrated about it, indignant. They said to each other, probably in Aramaic from the wording, see how you're not getting anything done, you're useless. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Well, if only. It was a superficial kind of hero worship the crowds were showing, but still, the Pharisees had totally failed against Jesus. But as for him, he was having all the success. It was only a few hundred thousand people, but still. Two things are revealed. The people by their devotion point to the fact that Jesus was sent into the world not to judge, but to save. John 3, 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. You see, John is saying the people followed Jesus rather blindly. They didn't really understand what he was about, but he's using the fact that they did to say that, yes, we should but we should have that knowledge as well. We should know that he really did come to save. He is the savior of the world. We need to come to him and receive that salvation from him. And as we see in the very next verse, which we'll have to wait, we see some Greeks and the Greeks represented the Gentile world and they were now knocking on his door. So God sent his son into the world to be the savior of the world for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You see, John seems to want to use these words of the Pharisees prophetically. When the gospel began to be preached, that was the general perception, that the whole world had been turned upside down. Acts 17, 6b, these ones having upset the world, come here also. 
So at the spiritual level, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to conquer the world by his death. He was coming to be crowned with thorns on a cross, to come into his kingdom by an exodus from this world. And by doing so, he would save a multitude from their sins. And that's what he is for you and me, I trust. And perhaps if you're watching online, that is what he needs to be for you. Do we recognize him as our Messiah, our personal Savior and Lord? Have we, as it says, gone over to him? Have we put our faith in him? Have we confessed our sins to him and received his forgiveness for, for rebelling against his rightful rule most of our lives? These are the criteria of salvation and God alone can draw us to fulfill them. Jesus Christ has died as the Paschal Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But we can only receive him by faith. And so we need that faith. We need to ask him for it. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for revealing these things to us, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our King who has conquered death itself and has the power to save to the uttermost. And we are grateful that the growth of your kingdom in the world and in ourselves does not need to be controlled by us. It's being controlled by you. And we want to give you all the glory for what you're doing among the nations and in our lives. Help us to trust in the Saviour, Jesus, the Messiah, for our own salvation, to rely on him alone um, for that and for living each day. And we pray if we're on the outside that we would We'd not be ashamed to come in, to humble ourselves before the Lord Jesus, confessing our sins and find that assurance that they're paid in full. And we pray that we who are in the kingdom might continue growing and overcome all that works against our growth. Lord, help us to identify those things and deal with them that we need to. Help us too to do the work of the kingdom since we are now those who come just as we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.